Great. Oh, well, thank you again for inviting me. Uh, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure. And um, okay, so um, as Mohammed said, I work at ITHRA. I'm uh, the creative director for the Creativity and Innovation Unit. So that's where we uh, think up our ideas and uh, make and create. Uh, and we also deal with entrepreneurship. Um, I have a second title as well, which is a curator for Tanween, and I'll talk a little bit about that later, and that's our creativity and innovation uh, season for ITHRA. Um, but today I really wanted to take this opportunity, and thank you again to Mohammed for that opportunity, is to kind of reflect a little bit uh, back on my own career and how that kind of ties into what um, I'm doing today at ITHRA. And so I've kind of looked at one of the, the topics that is a thread through my career in the last 20 years, and that's play. And really how using play uh, and designing with play has intersected with the city and the community within the city. So I wanted to start with a couple of images that I think for me just uh, exemplify uh, two points in, in my career and uh, this is uh, a, a, an image here from a, a group from one of our Tanwin Talen Challenge projects uh, from last year from Tanwin 2019 and it's looking at play tactics within the city. So how can we use play to research and understand the city? So why is this picture interesting for me? Is that all these people are asking the question is how do we play in the city? And I think that's really important because play is not just formally happening within play spaces, within parks, within uh, sports grounds, but all across the city. And, you know, so these informal spaces where people meet and gather and play and interact and explore ideas, tell stories together, is the real heart and culture of the city. And people doing those activities together they, they begin to occupy the spaces, they begin to define the spaces within the city. So this, this image is great to me because all these people are there to ask that question, is really how, how is the city um, developing its playful mindset? Where is that play happening? How do we continue that play to, to work? So this was a project that was done with uh, Fabrique, which is a, a London uh, non-profit collaborative platform, and they do lots of projects around play um, and architecture and, sorry. and the other uh, realm. Yes, sorry. Yeah, I'm interrupting you. We still see the image of the group, just in yes. case. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, okay. oh, fine. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> and uh, this is run by Reem Sharif and Mohammed Tavidi. So I love this picture because everybody here is asking those questions. The second image is from a previous project, which was to create a shelter for young people in a, in a park in, in North London. Now, this is from a previous career as a, as a designer and owner of a studio called Super Blue. And this exemplifies, for me, a design that we managed to achieve where we got different people playing, but playing separately in this image. So there's about three different groups of uh, uh, youth in this picture. They're all cohabiting the same space. They're, they're talking and they're playing together, but not necessarily interacting. They've all got their own space, but they're allowed to occupy the same space. And for me, that's a really important way of designing. Um, and it kind of goes back to the idea that uh, in terms of architectural design of our urban realm, we're creating lots of different stages for people to play out their lives in and to create their own stories and to create their own acts. A little bit like Shakespeare, you know, uh, all the world's a stage. So where did I start this from? And apologies for the, uh, the, the oldness of these pictures and it's probably showing my age, uh, previous to digital photography. So I originally started as a ceramicist uh, making ceramics and this is one of my uh, original products from my first studio after graduating and it's called the journey bottle um, this is a technique called raku firing it's a bottle that actually when you fire it all these cracks appear in the glaze and then you 
you dip it into sawdust and it catches fire, it burns furiously and all the smoke from that sawdust goes into these cracks and it creates these paths and maps uh, on the surface it and it uh, really was one of the first sort of products I made and I lived in the, the center of Manchester with my um, studio and I lived in a community where we wanted to celebrate the the inner city and we wanted to support the people creating the inner city and one of the things we wanted to do was celebrate that community uh, so we moved into the studio was to actually start to celebrate the urban realm and the image on the left here although it's a bit old and it's the best I could find, but was um, we started to repair bits of the city. So this is a curbstone um, that was uh, cracked and broken and, and missing. So we replaced it with this wonderful orange ceramic one. And then we started to, this a pattern, we started to appear around our little block and neighborhood uh, where we were repairing things. And eventually we got sponsorship from the council to put it on the back of the bus that went through our area. And this was us as makers, myself as a maker, using the tools we had to play with our urban realm. And then we started to use it, it became noticed and other people were playing with it. And eventually our local council began to play with us to carry on this celebration of our urban realm. I'm gonna take one back. This kind of method went on because really I started to understand that I wanted to work with my community. Uh, I wasn't just solely making objects uh, for a customer or client, but for lots of people to interact with in the ways that they wanted to interact with them. Uh, this project here is actually a very large ceramic bottle. It's about two meters high. And we put these into local parks while, but while we were making them, the clay's wet, the ceramic is wet, people can inscribe with your finger, you can make your mark. So on the inside of all these bottles are people's messages, people's poems, and then they are sealed up, fired, so they're solid ceramics. Hardy would last for years, if not uh, decades. And then we placed them in the park and we grew a tree through them. And that tree is still growing through these bottles today. But the messages are still there. So we started to engage people in the process of the making it. Even though we were kind of doing the construction, they could leave their mark with it. But then they could also see the time timeline of these objects as the tree grew through them or begin to absorb them. And maybe even the bottles will break and the messages can then be reread. So from that point, we started to play a lot more around uh, the public realm. Uh, this was a competition winner, and it, um, this was to create a uh, fountain around a roundabout. So as you drove around, the fountain would rise up to meet the level of your car. And this was really kind of a starting to, to be interactive in the spaces how people moved around them and playful out there. One of the key projects that really sort of um, launched as a studio was a commission which was from the Dinah Princess Memorial Playground in Kensington Gardens. And this is the Chiming Tree donation box. Uh, this uh, object, as you drop coins down different branches of this piece, it plays different tunes to you. Uh, so you get to encourage to put more money in to hear different tunes, to play different branches together, to get different uh, notes and rhythms out. Uh, this was really successful and it just highlighted the power of, of playful design in terms of they took uh, 10,000 pounds per week during, uh, through this, this very small uh, uh, money box. So through all these projects, it really became clear that community engagement was a really important part of our practice. So it wasn't just the engagement with the end object, 
but it was engagement within the process of the making of the object, the conceiving of the idea of the object, uh, and consulting with our communities to see what they uh, desired, what they, how they wanted to be involved in the processes, what they wanted for their goals and dreams. Uh, so this is part of that, that shelter I showed you with the, the groups. Uh, it was part of a project for three different shelters across three very different communities. And we took a process where we really went out, shared our process, asked people what their ideas are, what their aspirations were, what their needs were, and also how they already existed, how they interacted with each other in those parks. Now, it wasn't just our target audience that we spoke to, which was the um, teenagers and youths that you see in this picture. We looked at early years and how do younger kids who share that space in that playground uh, interact. But we also connected with other stakeholders. This is the local police officer. Now, we wanted to kind of really include everybody in the design of these shelters and the process of imagining how those spaces might be used. So uh, it was responding to really a kind of a need for, to give young people a space. It wasn't to give them an activity, it wasn't to give them something to do, it wasn't to keep them confined, uh, it was really to give them their space. And what we did end up having was great support from the local police because it, it meant that um, young people had a space to gather, but also a space where they could meet their local policemen and have a conversation with them. It wasn't a, uh, a place of conflict or um, it was a space where you could just be natural and friendly. And these are some of the outcomes. So one park, was quite quiet, but they wanted a kind of a stage they could do an event. So this is a more contemplative space. But again, it provides lots of different places for people around one object to, to fulfill their needs. There's a stage at the front of this. There's a, a, a screen to, to give a bit of privacy so you can have a one-to-one -one conversation. There's space for bikes if you're kind of being active. In this park, one of the big things we learned was the kids, they wanted to be up high. They wanted the power to observe the whole park. They'd been uh, you know, accused of climbing on roofs before, but this, this shelter then gave them the vantage point they desired and that they could play with, uh, interact with and challenge themselves. And that's a really important aspect of play that we found is that um, especially when you're dealing with playgrounds and public spaces, is the safety aspect. But how safe do you go? How do people learn and manage their own risk is really important and give them responsibility and the, the empower them to, to play freely and to learn from it. So that was our, some of our work within sort of uh, uh, in parks and public playgrounds. One of the uh, projects that really sort of defined my early career was uh, this piece and it's called uh, the Honeycomb Fence. This is uh, actually a gate, this, this particular example, and it's at Goodwood Sculpture Park. Um, one of the things we were always interested in in terms of public spaces was the boundaries between people. Um, in, in the UK, there's a strong tradition of hedgerows, which are soft, uh, even though they might have quite spiky plants in them. They've, they're visually soft, they're green, they're organic. They allow light to go through them. Um, they have that kind of uh, softer feel to them. They're not uh, harsh barriers. And that's what we were trying to achieve with, with the honeycomb fence here. So you can see as the light of the day moves across the sky you get this changing patterns through the through the panels but we didn't stop there what we did is we kept playing with this form and this in this shape and we did it out of wood and this is an example of the one of the wooden fence panels but you get this fantastic lighting effect 
and we actually started to this was a uh, working in collaboration with a dancer to actually use the panel like a pixelated screen so it's the, the screen is completely static with one light and the person is moving behind it creating all these fantastic uh, pixelizations so there's a real kind of interaction between the objects we're creating and how people can then play with them and I think that's a really important part of everybody's creative process is not just to stop but stop to keep playing with your ideas to keep uh, pushing them to see in which different directions they can go imagine them in different scales different locations with different users and you might be surprised what comes out of it uh, this this project here is is when we actually took the normal uh, metal railings and you can see the normal ones on the side there in the in the black and actually started to pull them extend them into this really kind of playful structure of seating and exploration so we worked with very different clients uh, we've worked uh, as you can see with local councils with schools um, this one was working with Canary Wharf in London. So this is the financial hub of London and we were part of their architectural festival during this year. And what we produced was, uh, this is called the Knitting Nancy. This is uh, over uh, 50 meters long of woven uh, rope with kind of balls put through it. And it's actually being knitted as we go along. This I love this picture. It's got all the city workers. So these are all the the bankers, the traders, uh, the high flyers from from the city sitting on our structure, interacting with it, having their lunch, um, and then having a go. So you can see the towers behind on this picture, and there should be a small video as well.
I think that last word there, it was made by everyone. So people coming to the park, they actually had a go and made that structure. Um, and that's a really a key part of the work that we do. Oops. Hello, Robert. Hello. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, so we will. Sorry, I've chance. lost the. Let Sorry? me just get the presentation back. Yeah. Is the okay. presentation in there? No, not yet. Okay. Let me bring it back. Okay. Apologies for that. Okay. So, yeah, as I was saying, importantly about that project and significantly was the fact that it was made by everyone. So we set up the tools for people to make it, um, the, the actual Knitting Nancy, but everybody that came to the park, they had a go at knitting a little bit of that structure. So it was a, a, truly was a kind of collaborative project with the community who were using it. You were actually knitting your own seat for lunch. Uh, and what we learned from that was the variety of different, uh, how the object actually encouraged people to share their stories with us. Um, from you know, eight-year-olds sharing how they used to use the same technique of knitting uh, when they were a child, to them then teaching their own grandchildren uh, to actually do the technique, and then going home and repeating it on a smaller scale. Our collaboration with Canary Wharf uh, continued, and, and this is another example of one of the projects we did uh, in following years, and these are called skyscopes. Uh, I don't know if people know about Canary Wharf. It's, it's a, a very unique site. It's built in the old Docklands of London, uh, but it's actually a private development uh, company. So, uh, and it's built, a lot of it's built over its own uh, shopping malls. So there's a big underground, uh, station as well as underground shopping and facilities but it also has one of the tallest towers in Europe uh, and so we decided to connect people with both of those uh, perspectives of the city so what you have here is uh, what we call the skyscrapes and these objects actually connect to cameras positioned on top of those buildings uh, to allow you to look out from the building and to also look down off the side and this is the view that it gave you. Um, so you, you could actually take the viewpoint that you were on top of the building, peering over the edge uh, and looking right down back on yourself uh, on the ground underneath. We had one other camera that linked to the, the shopping mall below the whole uh, facility. So you could actually peer at other people underneath as well. And that was a big part of us playing with the, the the city allowing people to explore it and play with it with us one of our other clients at the time was Arup and I'm sure lots of uh, the architects joining us tonight will know this uh, Arup engineering we worked with their materials department uh, quite closely for a number of years and this is one of the exhibitions that we designed with them and it's kind of key that I I've kind of feel that play is a, a part of it, uh, everybody's process of, process of investigation and of, uh, experimentation. And these guys really exemplified it. Uh, this, this particular exhibition showed all the different ways that they prototype, experiment, and explore within their own offices. And it was shared to the, the wider public through their window displays. And that uh, generated a few different exhibitions around how their process is so playful and then encouraging uh, the people walking past the windows to engage with them. Now, this project um, took us to a completely different environment. Uh, this is Brockfield Hospital. This is a mental health facility um, and it's a secure mental health facility. So it means that uh, the residents here 
have had to go through the courts and they're not there by their own will. They're there because they uh, have to stay there. But it's, it's people's homes. It's also it's somebody's workplace, people's workplaces. And we were invited in to work with the nurses and the residents in, in, in the hospital to find a way to create uh, spaces for them that uh, met their needs uh, and made it home for them. It's a really challenging environment. A lot of the uh, patients have difficulty with um, passing through closed, spa uh, closed shapes or different colors can, aggressive colors like you know, bright reds and pinks can cause uh, difficult reactions. So there was a, a whole series of kind of experimentations uh, playing both with the, uh, the staff and the patients in a controlled way to explore what were the kind of best colors to use, the best forms to use, and the formats of, that met their needs. I would really encourage anybody to, uh, if they get an opportunity to, to work with a client from this field, uh, is to take that challenge. Uh, it really uh, was a, a rewarding experience. So that was my previous career. Uh, in the middle of that, I led, I went off and I did a lot of museum design uh, and engaged people through objects directly, uh, leading a little bit back to my ceramics at the start. Uh, but it wasn't really engaging people with the city or their urban realm so much, but really just uh, through the stories of the objects. But five years ago, I joined ITRA, the King of the Z Center for World Culture. Uh, and with Idea Lab and the creativity team here, uh, in the past three, three years, we've developed uh, Tanween which is our creativity season. We have two missions for the season, and that really is to uh, help support and develop the creative industries in Kingdom and develop innovative thinking across sectors. So promoting creativity writ large. And that's really what Tanween has been. It's something that is uh, cre creativity writ large. Last year was our biggest event so far. We had over 100,000 people attending. And what we did is we took the theme play. And I'm just going to show you this little clip of really how that uh, was shown as an experience if you came to the building. So I think what you could see from that video, again, it was a little bit like a, 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 the city playing in the city. There's some active spaces there. There's some kind of more calm and contemplative, contemplative spaces. There's uh, spaces to explore and learn, to socialize. Um, 
and to really come together and play. There was another aspect to, to Ithra, I think, that doesn't really come to Tamween that year, which doesn't come across in those video images. It comes across as very, uh, you know, it's a family experience. Uh, what you originally would first think of when you hear the word play, maybe children engaging in, in play. But we also wanted to explore a little bit more about what play can mean for everybody else. Um, so I'm just going to take this one a bit further. So every year we have uh, speakers and panels to really uh, in, engage and investigate what play means and to provide lots of different perspectives uh, around the theme of the year. So last year was, was play. We have a different theme for this year. And let's just... So that was Nicholas Necroponti there talking. He was one of our keynote speakers. He's uh, founded the MIT Media Lab. Uh, I, I, you know, and I think it's great to have those voices really kind of uh, sharing was the importance of playing. And also what you could see from those images was, you know, playing through making, playing through doing. Um, and I think that's really something that we stand by here at ITHRA is that we want people to engage uh, grasp with both hands the idea of, of creating something and creating the world around you. So I spoke a little bit about what uh, Tamween is for, is to develop the creative sector in the kingdom, but it has a character and I think this is really important. It's interested in playing with new ideas. It wants to try and find new things, make a change in the world, and experimenting with possibilities. So we, we, we kind of want to walk the walk and talk the talk and be representative of, of really, I think, some of the character traits of uh, what uh, a strong uh, creative talent can be. And that's really where we want to develop local talents and those creative professionals, but also grow the kind of market of people through the outstanding experiences. So they experience creativity, they experience culture and engage it through what we do. So for this year, uh, Tanween will be October 28th to 31st. It's a little bit more con is condensed conference type uh, format just because of the times we're living in and, and dealing with COVID. But the theme is the new next bridging the gap. And it kind of comes from this quote from uh, L.P. Hartley, is the past is a foreign country, they do things differently there. But so too, the future is, is like a foreign land where they do things differently. We don't know uh, and we can't quite say yet what that, that land will be like, but we believe that creatives have that ability to envisage uh, and uh, help us formulate what that future will be for us, for them, for everybody. Um, one of the key parts of Tamween is our challenges. And already this is the kind of the, the pitch back to you guys, what we have coming up in the, uh, the, the coming weeks, and I urge you to look at the Ithra website, is our Tamween challenges. Uh, and this is where we encourage people to make actual tangible products and outcomes. These are the topics for this year, reimagining the crafts of Saudi Arabia, 
creativity needs you. So looking at how we can promote the creative industries in kingdom, visualizing the data of culture, how we use data visualization to explain the data that we're getting. Uh, a new outdoors, this is about engaging people with the fantastic environment of Saudi Arabia, uh, creating cardboard furniture, learning the techniques and uh, uh, challenge with creating new furniture from cardboard, and then the future creative placemaking. And this goes back to the heart of playing with the city, how to make our cities uh, creative for everybody. This is just one of the great outcomes from last year that's just gone onto the market. This was our Saudi board game challenge. It uh, was developed with uh, social enterprise rock, paper, scissors, and cheddar. And this is uh, a design from Hassan Al, Al Hakan. Uh, and it's really, it's just been launched on the market. It's in Kuwait, it's in Jiriyas, it's in cities across the kingdom. So really excited to be sharing that with you. Um, and I'll just share a little clip from the team. So I think that quote is absolutely fantastic. That really represents what we believed in with uh, play from last year and uh, they exemplified it through the challenges. I just want to leave you with one uh, of my favorite parts of the program from last year. And this was our Architects of Air uh, workshop. It really shows how we encourage people to get hands on. This is in the first half an hour of the workshop. This is all the participants within a giant bubble they created, trying to work out how to create a door to get back out again. They worked on big scale. They played and made iterations of what they were doing. It got bigger and bigger until finally they created this uh, full scale piece of architecture uh, alongside Ithra. So that includes, uh, concludes my journey through play, through a little bit of my, my life and my career and the relationship with Ithra and the city. So thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I think we can uh, ask people to send their questions if they have. Uh, I turned off your camera because the sound was uh, glitching. glitching. So okay. I, I just turned off so we can Back to your presentation, the, the sky towers, which had cameras above the towers and looking down to the urban area and gardens, actually, it's an impressive idea. I'd like it. Uh, it's very interesting how connecting the parks with the urban areas. Yeah, I mean, it really, that project really sort of uh, uh, highlighted as well against. Uh, the the position of cameras in public places as well so we mm -hmm. had our own camera that we positioned on top of number one canary wharf um our type of camera was actually next to uh, mi6's camera which is the security services within the uk we had the slightly newer version uh, and what we discovered is uh, just how good that technology can be we had to restrict the amount of zoom that you could use on the on the camera because we could see we could see the chewing gum walks into the pavement, um, and we could kind of, and it really kind of highlighted the the different perspectives that are given through cameras on the city that maybe you're not aware of while you're on the street. Mm -hmm. uh, 
we have Dr. Abir with us and uh, Dr. Yes, Abir. good evening. Yes, yes, hello. Um, thank you for the, actually this is a new approach uh, of uh, dealing with, with the public spaces, but uh, I'm concerned with the part before you, you joined uh, the, your project for uh displaying playing items in public spaces my question is uh, your goal is to bring people to get engaged more into public spaces but uh, uh, I, I i'm very much interested in the topic of who owns the public space and now who owns such uh, playing items now the experience for the user with such playing items is quite temporary and it, he, he still or she still feels that she's a visitor to the public space. So how can you handle uh, such an issue in terms of uh, getting people to feel belong, more belonging to such places than being a visitor who plays for like 10 minutes, uh, half an hour and leaves? Thank I, I you. Think, well, oh, yeah. uh, thank you very much for your question. It's, it is a really, it's a really good question and it's, it's always going to be a challenge to to kind of allow that uh, uh, people to feel like they have ownership over the spaces mm. and the activity they run in that spaces. I, I, I really kind of uh, I showed that. That's why I showed that kind of community engagement for the shelters um, at the start, which was to include them in the process of the decision making process, the design process, the to share how things are being created within their spaces, to allow them to to speak to those developments, uh, not just uh, maybe land things there for them to to use and then to fleetingly take them away again. So I think with all the projects, uh, I meant I mentioned the the mental health project as well, which was it, behind each of these is a a longer period of engagement with those audiences beyond much longer time than the actual design process or the outcomes. There's a lot of time listening from our side to really hear lots of diverse groups of opinion. Um, one of the things, the successes from the playgrounds projects was there was a feeling that things were being done without uh, a community's involvement. Uh, especially from an older population in one of the parks and they came on force they came a hundred people came and said we don't want a youth shelter in our park we don't want young people using our parks uh, which uh, but through that engagement process and engaging them with the other people in their community they understood why why there was a need for people to have a space that felt like their own um, and it also helped uh, that particular stakeholder group to reflect on what their childhood and youth experiences were and the freedoms that they made they had that maybe the youth today didn't have do, do you face any any cases of vandalism because of this no belonging uh, issue uh, so the park those parks actually had case many cases of vandalism previously so you know young people were climbing up on uh, items that weren't meant for climbing because they wanted to sit up high they wanted to take ownership um, because they didn't have a space for themselves there was other elements where which were just you know pure vandalism that needs to be managed um, but they weren't the, the the people that were actually living there or wanting to use the space um, i think we had quite a few cases where vandalism can be really dealt with by good maintenance. So if things look like they're being deteriorated, if they are run down, then people don't love them and care, care about them. But if they're made for people uh, and they're maintained for people, then generally communities tend to look after them, they defend them uh, and they use them more. Okay. Uh, taking it away. We have a couple of writing questions here. Uh, <clears throat> the question is from uh, Sarah. I wanted to ask if there was any concern regarding vandalism when, okay, actually, that, that was the same question we had already. 
the next question was from Bukhiyan. What is the most important element in designing these spaces? Lighting, coloring, or what? Or lighting colors or lights? Um, does it say which particular spaces? I think uh, for um, me, it, it, no. it's, it's interesting in terms of when you start talking about aesthetics. Um, and maybe that's what the question alludes to is, is actually this, the aesthetics is probably secondary, but it's your, it's your job as a designer to, to do, to make beautiful things, but in a way that function for the user. But you don't need to, I think there's always this part in projects where you, you start talking about colors. Uh, um, and everybody's got a favorite color. It's usually the most difficult part of a project because uh, everybody gets quite emotional about colors. Um, but actually, you know, that's where you need to kind of, that's where you can bring your profession and your expertise to kind of take that stamp. So it's not kind of a, a personal choice, but it's a choice that fits right for the project. Uh, and again, the, the mental health hospital, that was very key to, to, to choose the right colors that worked for that audience. Okay. Uh, this question from Sanita. My question is related to the current unprecedented times we have lived through. With mental health being on top of our design thinking, do you see the potential of engaging with play not just in public spaces, but perhaps also in our social interaction spaces? Uh, completely. And I think this is really key now. And I think I'm looking at my own children and, and my family in terms of mental health is, is so crucial um, and creating ways that we can still engage with each other um, in the physical space, I think is, is really important because although we, we can enjoy the, uh, the technological benefits of, of, of Zoom and the virtual world, that kind of the tactical, tactile and physical world and nature involved with that is really important for all our psychology. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question from Shahenda. As architects and urban planners, engaging the public is an essential part of the success of a project. It is what makes it unique and close to the people. Considering the current pandemic situation, do you feel we will have to come up with new ideas to implement playful spaces for the public? Um, yeah, I mean, hopefully we can come back to a certain amount of normality where we can create physical spaces, you know, and in terms of what I mean by physical is like tactile and sensory spaces. Mm. Um, but I, I, I think the challenge always is, is actually how to engage a, a good breadth of people in those projects. Um, that's why I showed that picture at the start of the group from last year of Tanween asking how, what do we want from our cities? That in question is so important to ask. And they went out and they did primary research in, a, in an area of Cobar to really kind of ask people how they used the spaces, what they wanted from the spaces, how they wanted to, to defend and keep those spaces. What were the priorities for them? Um, and I think that's, we need to do more of that to really get, uh, to empathize with all the user, users of our city and engage them in the process. Okay, so the second part of her question is uh, I also really appreciate seeing the initiatives in your presentation about the implemented works that are in Gulf region, which uh, has a very difficult climate. Further to that, how do you reflect on, on open parks and public spaces? Should we start coming up, for example, with a technology of indoor parks or, yeah? Uh, I, I think the Gulf region has uh, fantastic weather for quite a lot of the year. Yes. Um, and actually, I think we should be encouraging uh, people to explore their outdoors or spaces. I think we should be exploring how we work with the um, ecology of, the, of those spaces uh, looking at native planting, low water use planting, um, encouraging 
uh, biodiversity. This, uh, I know we probably don't like all the insects and the bugs and the beetles, but actually they're fantastic uh, and useful in our, in our environments. And to have them, you know, the flowers and plants that support those and to explore those uh, in our playground spaces, in our outdoor mm -hmm. spaces, we can support that through, uh, through design completely. Okay, so we still have one question, which we'll keep it for the wrapping up. And we have, I think, uh, Shahla Blushi uh, raising her hand. Um, Shahla? Hello. Uh, basically, uh, my question is, in designing the Tinween event program, a lot of talent and pieces and hosts are sourced from abroad. So considering the fact um, with the whole COVID-19 situation uh, and the designing such program takes such time, is it expect, uh, should we expect such um, defers from the past uh, events this year? So the event this year is taking a slightly different format. We're just going to focus on the forum which is over four days plus a program to support uh, uh, final year students, recent graduates and emerging creatives. Uh, the, the goal for Tanwin is always a, a, a part of ITRA's mission in terms of cross-cultural collaboration. So it does have some of the highest sort of international content, but it, it really it has a goal for the, in, within the next couple of years to have a 50-50 split. So 50% local uh, Saudi content and 50% international uh, right down the line. So we get that kind of real kind of sharing of cross-cultural collaboration. Uh, we, last year we brought in the Tanween stage so we were able to promote local talent and give them a platform to promote their talents from. Um, and I think this year what we're doing is with, a, with our speakers is it's called 10 by 10. So we have 10 different creative uh, disciplines and we're pairing up uh, international and local talent to talk about really what's next for them from their industry, from their careers, um, from their regions and uh, mm -hmm. uh, nations. Okay, the last question, which we kept up for the wrapping up, uh, this is from, I think, Fimo. Uh, what is the advice and tips can you give it to the an architectural student that he is about to start designing a public space, but in a roof? A public space on a roof? Yes. Gosh, um, <laughs> I guess it depends on whose roof it is, isn't it? I think probably ask permission first. Um, um, <laughs> No, well, it's actually, it, it's more about how to engage young people to feel li uh, lively and spaces. Okay. Um, so for me, uh, those uh, for spaces, you need variety. You really need to give people um, the choice to select how they want to use those spaces. So you're going to need quiet spaces, intimate spaces, people that can be where people can be on their own or one to one with somebody. Then you need those spaces that are really active and, and alive and people can can be competitive. And then you need those spaces that are a little bit more challenging. So people can take a little bit of risk within their play. They can balance. They can uh, maybe they, they're going to fall off. And I think. Mm -hmm you've got to play that balance between the physical, the hard elements. And again, like the comment earlier, it is about where do you bring nature into it? Where do you bring back, where do you bring the planting to bring other senses to it? You know, the softness, the smells, the sounds, um, the excitement through the nature there. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Robert. Uh, it was a really pleasure to have you with us tonight. Um, thanks for everyone who joined with us. Th thank you so much for the opportunity, and I, uh, yeah, I hope everybody is well. Looking forward to see you in Tamil coming next one, October. Uh, yes, yeah, I hope, hopefully uh, I'll see you in, in Tamil, and ITRA is back open to the public, so uh, with social distancing in place, so we hope that we're, we're 
running a, a safe operation, but we are open to, to invite you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Take you care. so very much. Thank bye you. Bye-bye.